Welcome to Learning in Relation, Creating Online Indigenous Language Courses. We are so glad that you are here. ASL and Spanish interpretation is available for this webinar. We are also recording the webinar for later viewing. Chukma Sohochifoet Kerry Chu, Chukasha Saya. Greetings, my name is Carrie Chu. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, a Chickasaw language learner, and an assistant professor of indigenous education at the University of Oklahoma. I'm also a collaborator with the Natalnuk One Mind, One People Partnership at the University of Victoria. I'm organizing this event with graduate students, Courtney Tennell and Melvin calls him, and will also serve as the moderator. Today, we are joined by a panel of indigenous language advocates who will discuss what it means to center indigenous ways of knowing and being in online indigenous language learning spaces. We recognize that we are currently experiencing multiple crises in our world, including a pandemic and war. Some of our panelists and team have been impacted very personally by this. And so I wanna offer um, special thanks to them for being here. And one panelist, Sarah Child, could not be here. And so we'll keep her in our thoughts. I also want to thank everyone who's joining us in the audience and hope that in hearing about the important work our panelists are doing, that you feel encouragement and hope to continue in your important work. I'm now going to pass it over to Courtney, who will share a bit about our project. Hello, my name is Courtney Tennell. I am a Cherokee Nation citizen and I'm a doctoral student here in the Zaro Center on, in, on transition and self-determination at OU. This webinar is part of a larger project that we're working on about how indigenous communities enact relationality in online indigenous language courses. For this project, we are talking with indigenous language course creators and also looking at examples of indigenous language courses from around the world. We have created an interactive map that shows where each course is situated with links to the course's webpage. Our goal for this project is to share practical strategies with indigenous nations and organizations, as well as others working to support language revitalization through technology. We are in the process of creating an open access guidebook with resources for communities who want to use technology to support their language revitalization. And we look forward to sharing this guidebook with you all when it's complete. Aho, Eonia. Good afternoon. My name is Melvin Carlson Jr. and I come from the Ponca and Muscogee Creek Nations of Oklahoma. And I am a doctoral student in the Adult and Higher Education program at OU. As we join together in this virtual space, we invite you to reflect on your relation to the place where you are now. If you'd like, share a greeting in the place you're from in the chat. Our organizing team is from the University of Oklahoma. The University of Oklahoma is on land placed by its creator in the care and protection of the Caddo and Wichita peoples and originally shared by many indigenous nations, including the Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, and Osage as a place of gathering and exchange. Today, 39 tribal nations reside in what is currently known as Oklahoma, many as a result of settler colonial policies of removal that were designed to erase indigenous people. No matter where we are logging in from, we acknowledge our connection and responsibilities to place and honor the land as a relative. It is my honor to now welcome Lakosh Joshua Henson from the Chickasaw Nation in Oklahoma. Lakosh will offer opening words in his indigenous language, Chickasaw. Yoko Cage, Manly. Um, I'm going to open up this meeting with some words from Mrs. Wellman. I'm sorry, she passed away. It's just I don't know how to carry. 
She passed away on Sunday. Ingi Jehovah Bash Benelima. Makaneta Kanya Pokota Vamatilaya Nanupano Taya Shugma. Atakya Pashaka Shima Ashke. Shalom be short to talk about. If a folk of man and a moment, I turn out skier, Shimaba Hancha Ashki and Nano Hotana Panot Ashukma. Nanagi Taman Pumba Nagma, Chimasas Alto, Tisha Hanchi Tok, Magnetic Kail, Chimasas Aoki, your butter farmer till I shook at Nano, Chimasin Sagmat, I asked him. Ich habe mich nicht mehr gemacht, ich habe mich nicht mehr gemacht, ich habe mich nicht mehr gemacht, ich habe mich nicht mehr gemacht. Oh. Ich habe mich nicht mehr gemacht. Mrs. Wollman war eine meiner ersten sehr ersten Lehrer der Sprache und das war definitiv ein schwerer Verlust für alle von uns. Okay, also heute sind wir von einem Grafik-Recording-Artist, Tanya Gadsby from Fuse Light Creative. And we'll now welcome Tanya to share about the graphic recording process for today. Kia ora, everyone. Um, I'm Tanya Gadsby. I'm zooming in from Lekwunen territory, currently known as Victoria, BC. And I'm pleased to be your graphic recorder for this session. Uh, and I will be capturing a summary of what we hear today uh, and, and organizing it into key themes on this graphic. Uh, drawing in real time while these ideas are shared and we'll pre periodically share the graphic into this space uh, during this session so you can check it out as it evolves and this will be shared out with everyone after the session as well. Thank you, Carrie. We will now hear from our panelists. There will be a Q&A segment following presentations. Please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. If someone has already asked a question that you also have, you can use, there's a little thumbs up um, icon in there. And so if you want to click the thumbs up, it will upvote the question. And on our end, it will bring it to the top of the list. So if there's a really great question um, that you want to make sure it gets asked, go ahead and upvote it so that we can see it. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Candice Gala. Candice is Ganaka Hawaii from Hawaii Island and an associate professor in the Department of Language and Literacy Education. Oops. And the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia. Her research focuses on indigenous language learning through digital and emerging technologies, embodied language practices and materials development. Welcome, Candice. Aloha mai kako. O wau no o Candice kali mamo o wahine kapu gala. He kanaka Hawaii ma kamoku puni nui o keawe. He polopeka ma ke kula nui o kolumepia pelekania ma kaina pono i o kalahui masquiam. Mahalo a nui. Thank you very much, Dr. Carrie Chu and the entire team for organizing this space for us to speak about Indigenous language learning with digital tools and technologies. I am grateful to be joining this webinar from the traditional lands of the Tongva people and recognize that while we are all joining from different parts of the globe, we are connected and bringing forth our Indigenous knowledges to the space to further our individual and collective understanding of digital tools and technologies as it relates to Indigenous language revitalization and education. I hope that my presentation on relational accountability to Indigenous communities, Indigenous languages, digital tools, and technology imparts some insight. In our Indigenous communities, there has always been a recognition, respect, and relational accountability to our kin and to the more than human relations, which includes our waters, mountains, trees, rocks, four-legged, the winged guild, and so forth. This kin-centric Ecology represents our intimate connections and, and 
our relations to one another and to our natural world, in particular to the lands that have birthed us. As we have been engaging with and through the means of digital tool tools throughout the pandemic, we are now more cognizant of the benefits technology can offer. For those of us who have been engaged in indigenous language work and technology prior to the pandemic, we have grappled with technology, have had to come to understand the tensions and opportunities whereby we need to question, explore, and analyze digital tools and technology. And sometimes even when suggesting it to our language speaker or learner community may have even experienced some resistance and for very good reasons. The same digital tools and technologies that we have considered, used, adopted, and adapted have created yet additional domains for dominant settler languages to occupy, overtake, and colonize, thereby reoccupying our lands, traditional and new and emerging spaces like the digital and virtual environments. For nearly two decades, we've talked about bridging the digital divide of indigenous peoples. But can we say that the digital divide is shrinking or is it continuing to grow as we think about indigenous languages, digital tools and technologies? While we can agree that we are engaging more than we've ever had through technology, are all of our community members, language speakers, learners, youth, adults, and elders receiving equitable access to digital tools and technologies? During my presentation, I will address four main themes that we as Indigenous language speakers, learners, teachers, community members, curriculum developers, content creators, technologists can consider as we grapple with the tensions of digital tools while also considering the opportunities and potential benefits. I will be posing questions throughout my presentation as a way for us to expand our knowledge about technology use, to question, critique, and better understand the choices we make when using technology for Indigenous language learning and teaching. While I have some real world experiences, personal and professional research and some insight, I don't claim to know the answers to these questions as we need to answer these in context and in relation to our respective communities and language situations. I also acknowledge that I am not speaking for or on behalf of communities that claim me, nor for indigenous peoples, communities and nations in general. I want to emphasize that there is no singular homogenous indigenous epistemology that can capture the uniqueness, complexities, nuances, and worldviews of distinct indigenous peoples, and there is no one size that fits all. It is my intention that this webinar allows us to be honest about our relation with an attachment to technology and encourage dialogue that results in a meaningful and relevant change that has positive impact on our communities and the communities the, that we are privileged to work alongside. The four areas that I will discuss briefly include relationality, indigenous data sovereignty, decolonizing praxis, and adaptability and sustainability. Dr. Vine Deloria, in his book, God is Red, A Native View of Religion, states that American Indians hold their lands, places, as having the highest possible meaning. And all their statements are made with this reference point in mind. Therefore, when we engage with our indigenous languages, we understand that language is connected to community, to the people of the community, and to a specific land, geography, and region. Dr. Robin Kimmerer poses the following questions in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass. How in our modern world can we find our way to understand the earth as a gift again, to make our relations with the world sacred again? Can we behave as if the living world were a gift? She states and continues, gifts from the earth or from each other establish a particular relationship, an obligation of sorts to give, to receive, and to reciprocate. So how are we as indigenous peoples and those who are engaging with digital tools and technology for language learning, keeping indigenous languages and places along with the community and people and language in mind? It may be common for tech companies and or developers 
in reaching out to help indigenous language groups to forget that language exists because of a community and not an individual. I'm sure we can name examples where the people and community were not even considered in the development. I want us to be mindful that these companies, organizations, and schools of thought exist, exist today in places that we work, go to school, and or are affiliated with. So when we engage with digital tools and technology, are we centering community needs and goals? And is language centered in community or is language being treated as a standalone object and data set that is void of culture, land, community, and generations of people? The vital connection of recognizing language as a foundation to people and a community is important as we engage with various digital tools and digital technology. We know that technology has the power to connect. However, it also has the capacity to further disconnect and divide, thereby not getting language to those who want it or need it. We want to ensure that our use of technology is returning our languages to our lands, to our communities, into our homes, schools, and to the ears and hearts of our people, thus benefiting us, Indigenous language speakers, Indigenous language learners, first and foremost. And any benefit to other entities or stakeholders are not central. The slogan for the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which began this year, is nothing for us without us. Anything that is for us should include us, no question. If we are developing and creating language opportunities, digital tools, and technologies, what steps have we gone through to ensure proper care, respect, protocol, permission in order to engage in the work that we are doing? Though we may have been entrenched and guided by our traditional disciplines, our practices do not need to represent a time of the past. We can evolve and change by unlearning non-relational state practices and relearning how to be in relation to one another, to the land and the life ways for the benefit of the community. Now let's transition to indigenous data sovereignty. According to the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, indigenous data sovereignty is the right of a nation to govern the collection, ownership and application of its own data. It derives from tribes' inherent right to govern their peoples, lands, and resources. This concept of data sovereignty positions Indigenous nations' activities to govern data within an Indigenous rights framework. Indigenous data sovereignty essentially recognizes that data and knowledge are inextricable from community and encompasses Indigenous values like respect for the data and those who are providing the data as well as principles of OCAP as shared by the First Nations Information Governance Center. The principles of OCAP refers to ownership, control, access, and possession, whereby First Nations have control over data collection processes and establishes how First Nations data and information will be collected, protected, used, and or shared. OCAP is a tool to support data knowledge, information, governance on the path to First Nations data sovereignty. There are a handful of other international organizations and networks that also assert Indigenous people's rights when it comes to data. But in the interest of time, we'll direct you to these two networks. When we engage with digital tools and technology, are we paying attention to the agreements that we effortlessly are agreeing to by scrolling quickly to the bottom of the page on the screen, what are we agreeing to? What are the implications when we share data and knowledge about our language on proprietary platforms, even in private groups? Who does this data belong to now? What can these companies do with our so-called data and what does that mean for our languages? And what would this mean for language and material that we consider sacred? How much control do we really have when we are using a tool that is not developed by us and developed for us. Indigenous data sovereignty helps us to be cognizant of what we should consider when engaging with digital tools and technologies for language learning and teaching. It is okay to question 
as through our questions, we can better be in, better informed, can be better informed on whether we adopt, adapt, or develop specific technologies for our language goals. Now let's turn to decolonizing praxis. Recognizing that there are many examples of language software, tools and technologies that have effectively taught language, specifically dominant majority world languages with millions of speakers, how many of these examples have included cultural knowledge, relevant photos and images that represent individual communities and not stock photos, and culturally appropriate phrases or learning activities? Oftentimes, language communities are not necessarily consulted, or if they are, an individual is contacted towards the end of the project in a sense to confirm or provide some kind of approval or validation. And maybe some of us in, um, on the panel, as well as in the audience, have received these types of requests. When we are engaging, designing, and developing language learning, digital tools and technologies, how are we decolonizing our practice? Is a development process and outcome deeply embodied and embedded in Western ideologies? Or does it reflect our indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing? In Dr. Joshua Schwab Cortez's research and paper, Keeping Up with the Sun, Revitalizing Isthmus, Zabotec, and Ancestral Practices through Cell Films, he grounds his work in communalidad, an indigenous Oaxaca methodology and practice and multivocal community process that is rooted in a commitment to strengthening the future of communal lifeways. He continues and states that communalidad manifests within a Zabotec cosmovision, asserting local strategies that engage cultural praxis, such as making black bean tamales, planting corn crops, or doing other embodied ancestral Zabotec practices, a process quite distinct from a classroom and curriculum-based approach. Partnered with cell film, informed by the techniques of participatory video research, the development process and outcomes of his project centered and included the community, collaborated across the generations of language learners and speakers, while effectively engaged learning through praxis, used new technology specific to the community, and supported the transfer of knowledge, language, and embodied practices in the 21st century. We can look to examples like this on how to decolonize our praxis by engaging our community for the benefit of our community, be it building our language capacity, being introduced to and becoming literate in digital tools and technology, strengthening our community and so forth. We need to ask ourselves when we are designing language learning opportunities via digital tools and technologies, are we using the default design that is grounded in Western ideologies and systems of understanding or again, are we making a concerted effort to adapt or create our own tools to reflect co our community values and pedagogy? Can decolonizing our praxis create a positive effect on Indigenous language learning? In designing and developing language learning opportunities, let's not just focus on the outcome of learning a phrase, sentence pattern, or grammatical structure, but rather the process and journey of language learning through relationality and reciprocity, engagement with knowledge, and building of a community of practice. Digital tools and technology are a medium with which we can access and learn language. However, we need to remember that people are tasked with creating these tools so that we can benefit. We do not need to be constrained by the way we've used technology or experienced technology for language learning. We have the freedom to be creative, to dream and imagine, future possibilities. Let's invest in digital tools and technologies that embody our indigenous ideologies, pedagogies, epistemologies, and that are accountable to benefit and in service of our communities. And lastly, let's briefly discuss adaptability and sustainability. Some of us are all too familiar with language materials and resources that were created at the turn of the century only to find that when we try to open these digital files, we're unable to read, access, or decipher what we wrote. 
or tight. What we end up seeing are nonsensical symbols that are irrelevant to us or to our language, or an empty box also known as tofu, which results in a loss of data. As technology evolves at a steady rate, we wanna anticipate that language data and knowledge embedded in these digital tools and technologies, as well as the digital tools and technologies themselves, are that we are using and are developing have some way of being accessible, transferable, and usable in the case of a software or tech company deciding to no longer support these technologies. How then are we ensuring that we have, that we will have access to our language materials in the foreseeable future? In Dr. Mary Hermes, Dr. Megan Bang, and Dr. Ananda Marin's paper on designing indigenous language, they write about a participatory process process of Anishinaabe Moan materials development and creation that engages community in an effort to help carry language learning beyond the classrooms and into all domains of indigenous life. In their design, they have reclaimed and repurposed digital tools and technologies for language revitalization toward meaningful community-driven goals. These scholars help us to think about and think beyond documentation and preservation efforts that in a sense can fossilize language. They conclude that it is up to communities to retool documentation efforts towards productive regeneration in communities, moving to revitalize our languages and seeing them as living can open up creative possibilities for communities rather than generating only preservation efforts. We want to steer away from digital tools and technologies that fossilize and make the data inaccessible or unavailable for our future learning, whether it is one year from today or 25 years out. We need to find ways that continue to build on our language work and not set us back when a digital tool and technology is no longer supported or used or the license expires or it is now not affordable to the community. We need to find ways to repurpose our language and language data to create additional opportunities for learning, while also recognizing that we need to consider flexibility, adaptability, and compatibility to and toward other digital tools that we use and are create while working to sustain the future of our language. As I wrap up, I want to, again, re-emphasize that when we engage in digital tools and technology for Indigenous language learning, that we consider how we are enacting relationality, how we are acknowledging Indigenous data sovereignty, how we are decolonizing our practice, and how we are ensuring the sustainability of our language. I leave us yet with more questions. How does indigenous lived realities determine, influence, and or affect the uptake of digital technologies? How is technology advancing community-led and directed language revitalization, reclamation, and education efforts? Who is benefiting and who has access? What are the unintended consequences of engaging with digital tools and technology? And what are the benefits? In what ways are we being responsive, proactive, and or reactive to our current language situation and to the needs of those we are supporting? How are we building language capacity in community and for community? What kinds of political, ethical, moral, and spiritual, social, and scientific discussions should we be having around the relationship? between tribal governmental, command of digital technologies, uses of ICTs by native peoples and indigenous pathways to decolonization. And this is from Dorte. How do we imagine our indigenous futures with digital tools and technology? And lastly, how do we as indigenous people reconcile the fully embodied experience of being on the land with the generally disembodied experience of virtual spaces? How do we come to understand this new territory, knit it into our existing understanding of our lives, lived in real space and claim it as our own? And this is from Louis, Arista, Pachaus, and Kite's work.
Technology has the immense power to reconnect. Reconnect us to our language, provide us access to resources through digital means, offers a multitude of ways of communication and expression, and expands our language domains. While there are many benefits, we also need to consider the challenges digital tools and technologies may pose for Indigenous language revitalization and education. Let's not compromise our Indigenous languages to fit digital tools and technologies. Let's adjust, adapt, and or create digital tools and technologies to fit our Indigenous languages, our Indigenous language goals and needs that will carry our languages into the future. Mahalo Anui. Yeah, cool, okay, Candice. Part of our project has been doing um, some interviews with different people who have created courses. And many of the questions that you've raised for the audience, you know, are things that people have been discussing in these interviews. And I know um, will be of great interest to those who are watching and will also be explored further by our next panelists. So as a reminder to those in the audience, I know some folks joined a little later. We do have um, Spanish interpretation. Captions are enabled. And if you have questions for the presenters, we'll save them to the end, but you can go ahead and enter them into the Q&A box now. Um, and so that's all available for you. Now what we'll do is we're gonna check in with our graphic recording artist, Tanya Gadsby, for an update on what's happening with the visuals. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, really, really uh, excellent points that were raised there. Um, we heard a lot around uh, data sovereignty, uh, the principles of OCAP, uh, and data ownership and control being really core to a lot of what's developed, and uh, tools and tech uh, based in our ways of knowing, um, not uh, relying on the way, the Western way, the colonizer way of uh, organizing and creating uh, learning applications, as well as the really key piece around relationality. Uh, that it's important this is rooted in community and people. And finally, always thinking of our languages as living, including how we put together courses and uh, technology tools, that we don't want to have it trapped in obsolete tech, our little fossilized guy down here. Uh, so thank you for that wonderful presentation. And back to you, Carrie. Yeah, okay, Tanya. So it's my great honor to welcome our next speakers. Heather Suter and Olivia Sammons join us to talk about the Southern Machif 7,000 Languages course. Heather is a citizen of the Red River Métis Nation and a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation. She holds a Master's of Education in Indigenous Language Revitalization from the University of Victoria and teaches Machif at the University of Manitoba. Heather also runs Prairies to Woodlands Indigenous Language Revitalization Circle with Elder Verna de Montigny. Their focus is on the reestablishment of, of vibrant speech communities for Métis languages using a decolonizing framework. Olivia is an assistant professor in Indigenous Languages and Linguistics at the First Nations University of Canada. Her work focuses on Indigenous language documentation, description, and revitalization with a focus on Machif and Algonquian languages. Welcome, Heather and Olivia. Olivia? Tanchikia uh, well, Olivia Salmon, Sishnagashon, Ottawa, Ontario, Nawika, Egwa. So, hello everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm Olivia Salmon, and um, this is Heather Suter. Um, Heather, did you want to um, continue here? Or? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, 
as is the custom um, amongst my people and as I've been directed by my elders, um, I would just like to start by um, with an invocation. So here's just an overview of what we'll be speaking to you about today. Um, we'll talk to you about the background and motiva motivation for the course, uh, give you a little bit of an introduction, um, talk more about the challenges and considerations and uh, the applications that we've had and uh, how this has contributed to community building and share some of our final thoughts with you. So who we are. <clears throat> so Praise to Woodlands Indigenous Language Revitalization Circle is now uh, an incorporated nonprofit. And we work out of uh, Camperville, Manitoba, which is uh, a traditional Métis community in uh, central northern Manitoba. And our mandate is, uh, as Carrie spoke, to, uh, alluded to, is that uh, reestablishing speech communities for Métis languages using a decolonizing framework, um, plus looking at how trauma has affected our communities, so um, using a trauma-informed and social justice lens, and uh, all working towards uh, having strong, vibrant languages, um, culture, you know, our culture and communities. Um, I, as uh, I was introduced, I am uh, I'm a Chief, a Métis citizen. Um, I am also um, a speaker of quite a number of different languages, not all of them Indigenous. Um, and uh, I am um, very active in my community. Um, I live in Camperville and choose to live and teach from Camperville remotely because I want to be connected to the land and the people. Um, so Camperville is located in the homelands of the Métis people and also on Treaty 2 territory. Olivia? Um, yeah, so I'm Olivia. I am coming to you guys from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg Algonquin Nation. And uh, I'm a linguist by training with some background in language education. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to work with um, uh, Michif language speakers and community members over uh, the last uh, number of years. And um, this, uh, these are courses through 7,000 languages are um, one of our most recent projects. So, and just to give a little bit of background about um, the Métis people and the language, um, so Michif, Southern Michif, um, is one of three language varieties that's spoken by the Métis. Um, the Métis have a history of removal and forced displacement, which gave rise to multiple speech communities um, throughout the prairies. Um, and so um, you can find it spoken in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Canada. And then it's also, you know, cross-border language, um, so into parts of North Dakota and Montana. The language itself is structurally complex, and it's what is often referred to as a contact language because it has parts that um, it's kind of a mixture of Cree and French, um, which makes it really interesting. Um, and it's being actively revitalized and reclaimed by Métis people across the homelands, um, but it, it is endangered. Um, so, and then Heather? Yeah. So um, our motivation for creating the course was because we have such a large diaspora that um, there are people all over um, the prairies regions and into Northern British Columbia, Southern, um, South, um, actually Northwestern Ontario, and then into the Northern part of the United States as well. And uh, it was being very difficult for learners to get access to authentic language resources. Um, we have a dictionary um, that we 
been digitizing, just an aside here, that went out of print in 1983. And so um, now to find copies of it is almost impossible. And so, you know, that's just indicative of, of the lack of resources really that we've had for our languages. And so we wanted to um, look at this course as being one way that we could reach out and kind of level the playing field. And in general, uh, we all know that there's been uh, increased interest and demand also for learning materials. So um, we were answering the call for, for these particular reasons. And um, our main partners for um, this project, for creating these courses, um, were obviously Prairies, and then um, the National Research Council of Canada um, provided support in terms of funding. Um, we we're very grateful for that. And um, the organization 7,000 Languages, which I'm sure you guys will be hearing more about. <laughs> um, and our project team, this is our lovely team. So. Um, Prairies to Woodlands, um, these were the members that were involved in, um, you know, various aspects of the project, project management, writing the curriculum, doing the documentation, the recordings, um, getting them all, you know, uploaded and put into the course. Um, on the 7,000 languages side of things, um, these are the, the people that helped out with that, and we're very grateful to them putting in lots of extra time. <laughs> um, and then these are our wonderful speakers. Uh, so Grace Ledoux Zoldi, Connie Henry, and Verna DeMontney. Um, Heather also did a, a you know, pinch hit a bit with reporting as well. So um, we're really grateful to have all of these um, speakers represented here. Um, so just to give you guys an idea of um, the courses, what, what they're about. So we're, I'm saying courses here because there actually are three. Um, so we didn't intend to create three courses. <laughs> uh, we just set out to do one, um, but after drafting everything, we realized that we had way too much content to cram into one course, um, that it would be you know, really overwhelming for the learners and probably not as effective. So um, it was actually Kaylee from 7,000 Languages who said, well, you know, you can do more than one course. Um, we said, oh, um, and so, which, I mean, it meant more work for her. <laughs> um, so it was very nice of her to even make that suggestion, but we ended up doing um, one main course, uh, which is the top one you see there, the Southern Michif uh, for Beginners. And then we did two kind of mini courses as supplements. Um, so the second one focused on verbs and the second one, and the third one focused on vocabulary. Um, so, and just a bit of general information about um, the courses. Uh, so they include recordings by both first and second language speakers. Um, you know, this is an effort to honor all speakers, old and new. Um, it was developed on the transparent language learning platform, um, developed um, freely accessible online and downloadable as a mobile app. Um, and this whole process of being involved in, you know, developing these courses um, has contributed to developing local capacity and technologies for Indigenous language documentation and revitalization. Um, let's see. So um, even just in thinking about how we're going to approach this at the beginning, we identified some priorities that we wanted to have um, right off the bat. One of those was that we wanted it to be interactive and um, communication based. That was really important to us, um, that it was based in uh, the social reality of Michif speaking people. So, you know, drawing on situations um, where learners could actually use the language in their everyday lives. Uh, we wanted to have clear, straightforward terminology um, as much as possible. So learners didn't get bogged down in you know, learning all the terms for things on top of the actual language. Um, and we wanted it to be fun. We wanted learners to be able to play around and be creative. And we wanted there to be um, a social aspect of, sometimes, of some kind, which can be a challenge when you're you know, looking at doing an online language course that people usually do um, on their own. So. So um, the approach we took for Southern Michif uh, for beginners was um, pre presenting short conversations um, to build vocabulary and conversations, as Olivia was saying, that 
are based in our social reality and our cultural realities. Um, we ended up using text and audio lessons. Um, we could have done more with, um, with video and images. It just ended up that way. There were some um, uh, constraints we had. So that's how it ended up. Um, we also used, uh, made sure that the language learning of the grammar anyways was implicit. So there wasn't a lot of explanation about things, but it was very carefully crafted so that people could see how our language actually builds up um, from simple forms to more complex forms. And so um, I'd like to give a shout out to um, Dr. Connor Quinn for discussions that I had with him on numerous occasions about the minimalist framework, which really helped in doing some kind of backward planning in our language, um, being an Algonquian language, polysynthetic, like uh, many languages, um, uh, indigenous languages are, um, it was really, really useful uh, for us to use this approach in addition to focusing on um, a communicative um, com a communicative language um, at, that allowed people to communicate immediately. So we wanted um, people to be feel successful right away. And that was really important, but not get bogged down like um, Olivia was saying earlier with linguistic terminology or grammar terminology. And uh, the other thing that we focused on, because we also run the Master Apprentice program, among many other things that we do at Prairie to Woodlands, we wanted to ensure that there was a lot of learner language, so survival phrases, so that people would stay in Machif, even uh, while they were learning. So if they're asking for new language, they would be able to ask for new language or supports by using Machif rather than having to go back into English. And uh, we really wanted people to be creative, be able to um, know that they could say novel things, say say things that they um, they thought up or that they were feeling in the language. And so we we worked hard to ensure that um, people would uh, not be overwhelmed by um, the amount of uh, language that was presented in each of the the lessons or lessonlets, I guess, um, and that they they felt that they could um, be creative. Um, and just an aside, one of the stories or one of the conversations we have in there just to add a little bit of fun was uh, with uh, a Martian coming to Earth and talking to some a Machif person so that uh, you know, we could, people could see that we can do all sorts of creative and innovative things with their language. It worked really well for language learning too, for some of the simple, simple constructions as well. So here is just a, an overview of the content. I had 20 units, um, each with one to eight lessons. Um, so as I mentioned, there's survival phrases, questions, greetings, hospitality, weather terms, family terms, especially family terms are important to, to Machif people and many indigenous, or I would say almost all, if not all indigenous um, uh, peoples. Um, but we talked about things that people could use in their, in their everyday life. Um, we made sure that uh, people would be able to use the language and feel confident in using the language immediately. So all of these, these topics were covered and then some of the more grammatical, I guess, uh, you know, uh, language pattern, uh, language pattern aspects that were covered were things like the French frozen copula, adjectives, notation, possessives, duetics, adpositions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, we had, um, a choice of a, quite a few activities that could be used in um, the 7,000 languages or that uh, transparent language platform. Um, we didn't use all of them. Um, we did um, ensure that um, there was our, how we structured things and the activities that we used focus both on declarative and procedural knowledge, but we focus mostly on using the activities that um, dealt with listening, speaking, and reading. And the reason why we didn't focus on writing is that we lack a widely used standardized writing system. We do have a standardized or a consistent writing system, but it's just not officially or widely used. And so we didn't want learners coming on and writing things the way that maybe their auntie or grandma had written them and getting it wrong in the course. We wanted to be really careful. We, we respected the fact that uh, there are multiple ways of writing still out there and accepted. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it is text heavy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so here we just have um, um, a screenshot from 
uh, from the course that just shows how uh, we have the unit objectives laid out and um, so that people will know what they can learn uh, from doing this particular unit. And so they can choose whether or not they're interested in this or whether or not they uh, want to go on to something else. We encourage people to work through the course because of using the minimalist approach, we build off of um, grammar patterns, often build off of grammar patterns you've used in previous units and lessons. But this just allows people some more autonomy so that they can choose what they want to learn when they want to learn it. So this is um, another example of a screenshot. So this is a learning path example from the main course. And you can see that there's just a little bit of information about what's included in it. And, um, and this is basically just how it's laid out all through all uh, 20, uh, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, we had three courses. We ended up with three courses. It's right? so the main course, which gives um, the framework, I would say, for um, a beginner uh, to learn the language. And then we added in um, I know, uh, a verb course because we, we, we knew that we needed um, to provide more basic verbs um, to people. And we just didn't have enough room in the course itself. There's some constraints and limitations when um, creating a course, um, a 7,000 language course. It's, so um, we just ended up, um, again, thanks to Kaylee's uh, suggestion, making some more. So we focused on verbs and then we did another one on vocabulary called And so this um, just basically introduces vocabulary, vocabulary language chunks more in a sense. Um, then Which means, sorry. No, yeah, limo, okay. it means more words in the chip. Yes, so. thank you. Yeah, we did. I didn't put that in there. Sorry, I'm so used to seeing it. I didn't oh. put that in. more words in the chip. So simply put, yeah. yes, more. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, and so um, we just added some, um, some communicative language that we just could not fit into the course that we thought was important. Yeah, so um, there were some things that we really had to give a lot of thought to um, as we went throughout this process. Um, one of the main ones was, um, you know, right off the bat, how is the language data going to be collected and used, kind of what Candace was talking about. Um, and so, and I know that was something that um, Heather had a series of extended conversations with um, folks at uh, 7,000 languages and the, the NRC uh, to talk about, you know, what that all means, what it would look like. Um, and so basically in the end, um, we arrived at a community centered license agreement. Um, so that was, you know, that was a, a real consideration there and obviously also consulting with elders and, um, you know, what their thoughts were about it as well. Um, identifying pedagogical frameworks. So in the beginning, we kind of talked a lot about how are we even going to structure this and, you know, there's so many ways of doing that. So, um, you know, really thinking through that. Um, and, um, you know, there is a lack of resources for Machif. Um, so there were times where we were um, basically trying to write a lesson and figuring out the grammar ourselves at the same time. So, um, because it wasn't documented uh, anywhere that we could find. So, um, you know, that is a reality that often happens, I think, in uh, with a lot of indigenous uh, languages. And um, there are also, for the recent resources that do exist, there's you know, a tradition of um, using terminology that is uh, less than straightforward, we'll say. Um, and so um, that was um, something else as well. So, um, and then another really big one uh, was a lack of standardization uh, in terms of orthography and in terms of, you know, dialect variation. Um, and this is, can be a really sensitive topic for a lot of people. And so we definitely approached this with a lot of reflection and discussion. Um, and, you know, there can be real consequences for how the course will be received, um, used or not used, things like that. So uh, we really wanted to approach this in a respectful and inclusive way. Um, so, you know, we spent a lot of time, you know, weighing different options. Um, in the end, you kind of have to make a call one way or another, or you'll just, you know, you won't be able to go forward uh, with things. 
um, something that we wanted to keep in the front of our minds was what is going to be the most effective um, for learners. Um, and so that was something, you know, that kind of drove our choices. And, you know, whichever way you choose, just make sure that you're consistent, because if you're not, it will be very confusing for learners if you're going back and forth between orthographies or, you know, dialects or things like that. Um, and so one way that we approach this was, um, you know, not to say, you know, like this is the right way and the only way, but, you know, just saying like they're for orthography. We said there are many different ways of writing Michif. Um, this is what we're doing. This and then spell it out. This is what maps to this. And, you know, just be clear about it um, and not, you know, making a, a hard line in the sand. Um, and then for variation, in the introduction of the course, we had a statement about variation, um, just emphasizing that all ways of speaking are valid. And so we're not trying to promote one variety over another, um, but they're all um, honored and valid and important. Um, so that was one way that we you know, tried to address this issue of lack of standardization. Um, and then as far as terminology goes, um, wherever possible, we try to use uh, MITCHIF internal ways of referencing grammatical phenomena um, instead of using technical linguistic uh, terminology. So one thing that's really common um, with uh, MITCHIF and Algonquian linguistics is, you know, this division between nouns where there's sort of living nouns and non-living, which are called animate and inanimate. Um, and we just called those ana and anama words. Um, you know, referring to the living and not living. Um, and that seems, it seemed to work pretty well, I think, with the folks who have used the course so far. Um, yeah. Oh, Heather, I think you're muted. Sorry. Thank you. Yes. So one of the biggest things was how this tool was going to help us um, recreate speech communities. And, um, you know, it was really, it was really hard. There were tensions um, uh, between pedagogy, the pedagogical approaches that we wanted to take, and the course framework itself, the, the physical framework of how, uh, you know, like a computerized, um, um, computer-assisted language learning um, course is set up, and also problems between an online asynchronous course and language that is necessarily social and relationally um, focused and especially when you know when learning that that's just how it is so we had to think about how this would support that um, so one of the things we thought about from the very beginning was how to use a decolonizing framework um, and to work from within the language thus um, talking about say even using terminology that was uh, internal to the chef as, as Olivia mentioned, but also um, focusing on making sure that we were building capacity to do this language work for ourselves so that as we move forward, we, we might be able to um, better adapt or even create frameworks that are, are much more relationally oriented. Um, we wanted to um, celebrate Indigenous worldviews, especially our, our worldview and ways of, you know, ways of living in, in our communities in, in um, in, de in this development, um, we made sure that um, we launched a, a, a social media group before the course was launched so that there would be a way for people to engage with each other, their peers and speakers, um, as they were working through the course. That was really important. We didn't, we couldn't do that internal to the course, so we realized that we need kind of an envelope for that, to do that. Um, and encourage people, of course, to look at this course as just being one tool among many, um, especially um, recognizing that breath to breath um, learning um, and breath to breath speech communities are paramount. And that's where, where the language really lives, is out in the air with all of us. So it was really about how to connect, uh, make connections between um, the Métis diaspora and those living in home communities as well, because we're spread out over such a large geographical area. So we had a launch on March 19th last year called Creators in Conversation. 
and our messaging was about coming and having fun with us, that it was free, um, it allows you to learn at your own, on your own schedule, and that you could learn with a, a community of dedicated language learners. So that's how we approached right from the beginning, trying to um, build in um, relationality into um, the use of the course. And well, before the pandemic, yes. we had actually planned to go around and you know do a live you know, visit many communities that it turned into a virtual thing, so. That's right, that's, yeah. So it was supposed to be in the communities where we demonstrated it and we ate with everybody and we had fun with everybody in person we could try it out, but this is what it turned into because of the pandemic. Yes, thank you, Olivia. So how is it being used today? Um, I went in and checked and it looks like we have 567 users still. Um, uh, it's being used to supplement a lang language courses at the University of Manitoba, where I teach. Um, I also use it with online um, community language classes. Um, for community building right now, we have over 800 members of our Facebook group um, that focuses on this language. And to become a member of the Facebook group, you actually have to ask quite a few questions about you know, what your intentions are, what your positionality is, so that we all know where we're coming from. It's not to necessarily to exclude people, um, you know, but it, I think it's really important for people to think about those things as they enter into um, a group of learners where um, many of whom have been traumatized and they're suffering from intergenerational trauma, especially around language learning, and there's a large burden of shame. So we wanted just to make sure that people understood what they were the community that they were entering entering into. And on a more technical note, uh, the sound files, we've repurposed the sound files as well uh, from a chip phrase of the day. And they're also going to be going, um, uh, the, the phrases used in the course will be uh, put on plaques for a walking trail. It's happening right now and with QR codes. So we've repurposed things. So we're repurposing. So it's not just in the course, we're, we're taking advantage of it. And we have copyright builders and, and we have copyright of, of everything. That was a really big, hint. so data sovereignty, we hear you. Next, please, thank you. So here, um, we're not gonna read this, but if you can have a quick read yourselves, you can see these are some of the community voices um, from the Facebook community group using the course. And you can see some of the things, um, we've highlighted some of the things that we think are particularly telling. Um, so, um, you know, that it was accessible before and they like the gamified way of looking at things. Um, they can use language in many situations, not feeling rushed um, because they can do it at their own pace and that the delight that they feel at being able to recognize the fluent language, the words that the fluent language people is using. And there's one more. Um, uh, Candace B is a young woman who has a young family and her, her daughter reminds her every day that she, they have to do Machef and they want each, she wants to use the, the program with her. And she likes that, um, that the themes, and they're not really themes, but the conversations are focused on um, things that we would do, actually do with our relations, especially the, our older relations, yeah. um, and that it's culturally relevant. So uh, again, I, focusing on the younger people, you know, it's saying that they like it because it's interactive and gamified. And again, very accessible. So there's some positive thoughts there. So some future directions we have is uh, using the course of part of synchronous online community classes um, in, a, in a broader way than we have been. Um, perhaps creating additional standalone lessons um, in the lesson author, using the lesson authoring authoring tool available on the uh, platform. So you can add single lessons afterwards, which is really great. Um, so you can have your whole course and you add these lessons. So it, it, technically you can keep on working on this. It's uh, and increasing your uh, the information that's out there. And then possibly doing a version in the Turtle Mountain Orthography, which is in the, in the dictionary I spoke about um, earlier in the presentation. And then maybe even creating a new higher level course. So our final thoughts, um, we highly recommend that um, you investigate the legal issues around intellectual property, copyright, and data sovereignty very early on, that you have in-depth discussions with uh, your elders, your community, and your partners, um, because this um, almost was a deal breaker for us. 
that we almost said, no, we're not going to do this. It's great that you want to do help us do this for free, but we're not we're not going to do this. So um, it took a lot of discussion for us to get to a place that we felt uncomfortable. We felt that um, that the benefits outweighed the risks, and also to plan early for the soft side of uh, integration into relational learning. So to be really clear about how you're going to use um, this tool um, to build up your community and to ensure that um, the focus is on interpersonal communication and um, and and that it's grounded in your social and cultural realities. So, um, and a more practical thing here is understanding the back end of the platforms because there's many important things that you can learn from um, uh, poking around in the back of the, of the course, the metrics, um, who's using what and how to manage classes. Um, so you can actually have classes and you know different classes using the course. So that's something that I think um, knowing that you can do that early and how that might work or not work for your community. Um, of course, expecting and planning for challenges and delays. That's always difficult when the funding that we get usually is project-based and there's deliverables and timelines. So this can be particularly um, difficult, but to really um, make sure that you give yourself enough time to do this. Um, including your budget. Um, uh, now, uh, online launch and marketing, I think that, you know, even if the pandemic wasn't here, that we would have had to have done that anyways to reach all the people who wanted to reach. So include that in your, in your budget. Um, something else is also to include um, animation of your social media groups and your planning. So um, we have a Facebook group for now uh, around this course. And sometimes um, it is uh, really a challenge to get in there and to comment enough to keep things moving and lively and, and vibrant. So that's something to, to really consider that you might have to dedicate a person to, to do that. And uh, that would be um, you know, their, their main role. Um, and as I mentioned, the use of media uh, created for the course in other ways, um, it's really important. We have a minimum amount of time <laughs> Um, to do a lot of work. And so um, finding ways to um, reuse and new ways to um, utilize um, the recordings in particular um, is great. And, um, and then of course, always keep in mind that you, once you finish your course, you're gonna find some typos, you're gonna find some things that, you know, to the best of your ability, you thought that everything was good and there's gonna be some mistakes. You need the time to go in and correct those. And then also, how are you going to improve it or update it when you learn new things or new ways um, that you didn't, you weren't exposed to before you started on, on the journey? So we have um, other technology-related projects as well. Um, I've been working with the National Research Council um, as their the chair of the Indigenous uh, Language Technology Advisory Group. Um, and, uh, and we have made a couple of things with them. Um, the Turtle Mountain Talking Dictionary, um, again, this course, the Turtle Mountain Talking Dictionary, which Olivia is also um, a co-lead on. And we have a verb conjugator um, that is um, just coming out in another version. So um, probably if you clicked on the link today, you, you wouldn't get anything, but in a few days from now, you will. And uh, that one was built from the bottom up by a Métis um, uh, computer science uh, master's student and an intern, um, an ally at the National Research Council. So it's very exciting to look at the capacity building that was going on with that. And then we are um, mobilizing some legacy recordings and this also has been um, a bit of a challenge. Um, so, um, we're, but we're excited to be able to bring that forward. And uh, something that's in process is a phonological awareness app from a chef. And that happens to be um, a master's student in computer science, a, a master's project that they're doing for us. So we have these um, these these kinds of uh, technology projects, and uh, we also, like I said, run a master apprentice program. We also do consulting for school division, and are working right now on developing. We'll have developed a, um, two programs for a university. Um, in Indigenous language pedagogy and also development of, um, of allies in um, 
at educational administration and core language and, and core teach, uh, core subject teachers as well. So we're, we're pretty busy. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Could you Marcy? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my cat. That's is a small child or a baby that I'm that I'm <laughs> that I'm torturing. It's my cat. Sorry. So if you want to get in touch with us, we put our contact information here. Um, both Olivia and I um, welcome your, your questions, comments, and um, and ideas. Ekoke Hachimene Lee. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, Heather and Olivia, you're getting lots of love in the chat on the webinar side. Um, and I just really appreciate this presentation because I think it really speaks to what we were also hearing about from Candace that, you know, technology is just a tool, it's not a solution. Um, and that Ultimately, it's just one piece in a bigger language plan that we have for our communities, you know, now and into the future. Um, so really amazing work. Um, I, I can see lots of questions coming in, lots of interest in this project. And um, the Southern Machif course is available for free. We put the link in there. So we really encourage you to um, check out the course and to really, you know, use it and see what this project is all about. So now I'd like to bring Tanya back up so we can check in on the graphic recording. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thank you to presenters for that amazing overview of all that hard work. It's just incredible to see and really places it in context of what this looks like. And so we use sort of a theme of, of the Métis sash and how some of those threads might be linking in here to community and people and that we're building something uh, bigger as, as we're doing this language work, um, guided in, and rooted in knowledge keepers and language keepers. Uh, and some of the highlights around what this course is like and how it's designed, that we've gamified it, that there's audio and visual, and that it's progressive and learning at your own pace or whatever you can do. And uh, following our, our sash thread here, um, some of the challenges and, and considerations that are really important when designing a course like this, um, orthography and variation and dialects, uh, it's complex and, and uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Um, let me just move myself here for a second. Face-to-face uh, -face learning, breath-to-breath -breath is really key, but that we, we definitely, with the online learning, have this opportunity for building a robust community and that that should be thought of from the start when you're putting together these courses for sure. And another echo of that beautiful piece around data being owned um, by us as well being really foundational to this. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, cookie, okay, Tanya. So the next, um, the next presenters that I'd like to invite up are Lokosh, Joshua D. Hinson, and Juliet Morgan, who will join us to talk about the Chickasaw Rosetta Stone course. Lakosh is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and a conversational speaker of the Chickasaw language. He earned a PhD in Native Language Revitalization from the University of Oklahoma. He is currently the Executive Officer of the Division of Language Preservation in Ada, Oklahoma on the Chickasaw Nation Reservation. Juliet Morgan is a linguist for the Chickasaw Language Revitalization Program and also holds a PhD from the University of Oklahoma. In addition to her work on the Rosetta Stone project, she assists with curriculum development for the Chukusha Academy Adult Immersion Program and further documents the grammar of current speakers and learners. Welcome, Lakosh and Juliet. Chukma, Ilash, Chukma, Mark Nitikikan, and Rosetta Stone, I am Makahachi Manole Lacho. Um, uh, we're happy to be here and appreciate this opportunity. We're going to talk a little bit about our Rosetta Stone Chickasaw um, project today. Get that next slide. All right. So we're going to talk um, about who we are, not so much as individuals, but who we are as a community. Why we felt compelled to create um, this product, how we went about creating this product, 
and what are we doing with it now and the variety of applications that we see emerging from Rosetta Stone Chickasaw. Um, our people, um, our, whole, our homelands, the old country is in uh, northeastern Mississippi, northwestern Alabama, parts of Tennessee and Kentucky. And we lived there from time immemorial until we were forced to remove beginning in 1837. Today, we uh, reside on the Chickasaw Reservation located in South Central Oklahoma, which was the traditional homelands of many other groups, including the Wichita's, the Caddo's, Kiowa, Comanche, Apache. Um, Indian territory is a complicated place. And then uh, here you see some of the, the images that we captured um, of our last, these few remaining native speakers. We'll talk more about them um, in the moments to come. We worked with Ryan Redcorn, who's an Osage photographer from Pawhuska, Oklahoma, who lives on the Osage Reservation. And um, these, these images really capture the beauty of all of our teachers. And we are appreciative of Ryan Redcorn capturing these. All right. So we're often asked, why, why would you create um, an online language course for your language? Why is it that you were able to uh, develop this relationship with a company as large as Rosetta Stone? Is that even a good idea? We get lots of questions along these lines. And really the simple answer is um, people wanted it. People wanted it. We are um, a large tribal community. We'll talk a little bit in a minute about our size and our location, our demographics and so forth. But from the moment I took over direction of this program in 2007, people were constantly asking me, when are you gonna do something online? Uh, they clearly wanted computer aided language learning products of some sort. And because Rosetta Stone is a multinational company and has exceptional marketing and you, know, you can see it all over the place, online into kiosks at malls, back when malls were a thing, it's something that they were familiar with, right? And they, they wanted this um, for themselves. Uh, we had many, many other resources prior to beginning this project in 2014, 2015. Print materials, including three excellent dictionaries, a grammar workbook, um, we have a, a prayer book that was authored by the Chickasaw Language Committee, children's books, cookbooks, flashcards. We have a language app that runs on um, Android and Apple devices. We have a ton of videos on Chickasaw.tv, ChickasawLanguage.com. And then, of course, um, adult community employee children's classes, immersion, an immersion program. We, have a, we had a traditional master apprentice program here on the reservation. But as we, seven years in roughly, uh, as we were examining what we had been doing, what was working and what wasn't working, we really wanted to, to speak to the community directly, not just here on the reservation, but Chickasaws worldwide and find out what, what is it that they really wanted in terms of the available resources. There's some sort of piece that was missing. And they indicated that they really wanted a structured online language learning course, um, surprisingly with regular assessments. They wanted to be tested. They wanted to know if, if they were um, doing good or not. And this falls in line with sort of our ethos, like we're, we're committed to sort of two areas um, in our work. One is immersion, the creation of a, a new speech community, and also enrichment and education for the rest of our folks who may never actually be able to sit down in person in the same room, share space with a native speaker. Our mission for those people is to ensure that worldwide, regardless of where they live, as long as they could find a Wi-Fi signal somewhere, they could have consistent, reliable access to their language without impediment. All right. So today we're a, we're a large nation. Um, we all descend from roughly 1,700 people who managed to survive tribal warfare in the 1730s, and now we're up to 73,000 enrolled Chickasaw citizens, 57% of whom reside in the state of Oklahoma, 70% of us live off reservation, and we have approximately 35 native elder speakers remaining out of this population of 73,000. We have Chickasaws worldwide, Okinawa, 
uh, the UK, Australia, um, and for this sort of large displaced diaspora community, many of whom have never, literally never heard the language spread across all across the state and the country. It was so critical to us that online education became a tool that we could, um, we could leverage for the benefit of our people. Um, it's not that we hadn't done other, um, you know, media-based, web-based, that sort of stuff. Um, this was something that they asked for very specifically, um, and they wanted to be guided um, in a leveled sort of way. So we decided to jump in and create this for them. All right. So um, we did not immediately um, form a relationship uh, and come to some agreement with Rosetta Stone. Um, I did, I sp spoke with them sometime around 2009, 2010, and they had at that time sort of put a pause on their indigenous language program that had created products with the Chitimacha and the Navajo and the Mohawk and the Nanupiak and so forth. They, they weren't really doing that at that point. So we examined, um, you know, other possibilities. One was even doing it ourselves, sort of a Fosetta stone. Um, but ultimately we presented these um, options to um, tribal government and our governor, Bill Anoatubi. He, uh, he came back and he said, we shouldn't miss an opportunity uh, to provide something like this for our citizens. I'm not really concerned about the cost. What cost can you put on your language and helping it get to all of our people? So we were able to sit down at the table with Rosetta Stone. We worked out the intellectual property rights. We retain all rights to all the language content. Um, it belongs to the Chickasaw Nation, uh, to the Chickasaw Nation government, and to the people who elect our government. Uh, the only proprietary aspect of Rosetta Stone itself is their architecture, their program architecture, but all the language belongs to our people. And that was so critical. So once we, we were able to arrive um, at this agreement, we began to work and um, sort of examine what this could look like. We'll explore here more in a moment about uh, what this custom product was really um, all about and enabled us to do. Um, but you can see here, we created 40 lessons for each level. We began with a release in 2016, and then we're on track to hopefully complete level four by the fall of 2022. Um, I will turn it over to Dr. Morgan at this point. Yes, so like Josh said, we've been working on this product for seven years now. By the end of this year, we hope to have all 160 lessons completed. Uh, it has been a lot of work. On this last line of the slide, I have a list of some of the elements that we created for each level. And these are some things that are probably common across all online uh, language courses. In today's talk, we're gonna specifically focus on um, the videos, audio recordings, and images, because these are elements that, of course, are not specific to the Rosetta Stone software. We are gonna show you some screenshots of the Rosetta Stone software, um, so you can see what this product that we're talking about looks like, but we're gonna focus on how we centered Chickasaw community and culture and in the uh, video, audio, and images. Um, before we move on to looking at the actual Chickasaw product, I did want to speak a little bit more about what that custom structure means, just in case anyone is familiar with Rosetta Stone, um, because the Chickasaw product looks really different from most of their other products. Um, usually their products use audio and images and text to teach, and uh, this screenshot that I have here is from an Arabic product, and I think it's teaching the words for man and woman. Um, but a common criticism I've seen of Rosetta Stone is that they use the same images and audio across their products. So they use the same stock images, they use the same um, vocabulary list, and they just have them translated into that language and they record native speakers uh, for that. So you can see the, the stock images being used here for the Arabic product. Um, so we went in uh, a different direction for the Chickasaw product. We did the custom structure. And one of the bigger differences was that we were able to use uh, video. Usually there's no video in the Rosetta Stone products. Um, and also, uh, so like I said, they, they usually, like they could provide all of the um, images and they could provide the vocabulary list, 
And having all of that pre-decided and pre-recorded for you would have taken out a lot of the work for a product like this, but it also would erase uh, so many of the opportunities to center Chickasaw culture and community. So that's just another reason why we went in the custom direction to get the video and to uh, avoid some of the issues that other Rosetta Stone products have. So now we are going to look at some screenshots of the actual uh, Chickasaw Rosetta, or Rosetta Stone Chick Chickasaw product. And what we have right here is uh, this menu bar that shows you all the elements that you see when you enter a lesson. And we're not going to have time today to look at all of these elements. We're just going to look at a few of them. So like I said, we're going to focus largely on uh, the video, the images, and the audio. So the introduction to every lesson is a video, and it's entirely in Chickasaw. Uh, we're going to watch one of those in a moment. Um, so this is the very first thing you see when you come into the lesson. And then once you complete the introductory video, you move into a vocabulary section that um, teaches you the new words that came up in the video, and then you move into a usage section, uh, which explains some of the concepts. So this is the usage section is where you have more of a direct teaching. So these titles in this menu bar um, were kind of hard baked into the software. They were something that we could not change. So even though we got the custom product, that sound that word is a little deceptive. It makes it sound like we could have built from scratch whatever we wanted, but that wasn't the case. Um, and this is an example of that with uh, these titles that we couldn't change. Like the term usage, I've always found kind of clunky, and we couldn't change that. Um, and later, uh, Carrie suggested that you know we should try to make the whole product in Chickasaw. We could translate these into Chickasaw, and that that wasn't an option either because of some of the limitations of the Rosetta Stone software. So we're going to take a look at uh, one of the introductory videos. So we're looking at one of them from this lesson, lesson 81. So this is a, a more advanced uh, lesson. It's from the third level. Um, the initial level, um, the videos have a much simpler language, um, but this one is a little more advanced. And when I play it, you're going to see that there are English subtitles provided. When you're in the Rosetta Stone product, there are never any English subtitles. There's only the option for Chickasaw subtitles. Chukma so you for Chalawa, a Chikoshkuma toks a lily. A famicash to Kasha Iho, Hemeta, Malili Lituk, Yapa Anki. Chukma so you for what Ben? Chikashi Yakni, a toks a lily. A famicash, and a Pabasha, a Sisla, and an ally took. Yapa Amiho. Chukma, so hold your poet Lisa. Chikasha, I a tana toks a lily. Tompale ish diagma o sapo shea toks a lila chi. Yapat sashke. Chukma, so hold your poet lily. Uksub stick bag punchly. Tompale much kasha numpa imobachi la chi. So if you were um, going to be creating this sort of content for an online course, we wanted to point out a few things that we learned um, from doing this. And these are kind of uh, encur some encouraging words that um, if you were going to take on this kind of work, you don't necessarily need to have a large cast of fluent speakers. Everyone in the video um, is a Chickasaw citizen, but only the two grandparents are native speakers. The other four uh, members of the family were learning the language as they did this work. You don't necessarily need um, a whole lot of sets to visit. Um, most of our videos center on being in the home and the uh, Chickasaw family home that was featured in the videos is actually Lakosha's uh, old home. So the Chickasaw film crew used to regularly just invade his home and record there. You don't need an expansive scope of topics. Um, like I said, most of our videos centered in the home. So most of the time, the videos were just, what is this family doing? What are they talking about? What are they, uh, 
their day to day lives, you know, just hanging out in the home, cleaning, cooking, going to the grocery store, things like that. You also don't need a large group of people to create this sort of content. Um, most of this content was created by Josh, Carrie, and myself under the direction of an elder speaker committee with uh, four native speakers. And of course, lots of support from Chickasaw Nation leadership and uh, Rosetta Stone personnel. But a large, mostly the content was created by uh, quite a small group, which I think often surprises people given how large uh, this product is. So once you um, watch the introductory video, which they're always all in Chickasaw, we don't usually have the um, family like speaking to the learner like that. It's usually more of like a sitcom style, like there's little story arcs and we try to be funny. Um, but once you watch the video, it introduces uh, what's gonna what you're gonna cover in the lesson. We don't expect the learner to understand everything that they saw the first time. But once they finish the video, they move into the vocabulary section. And in the product that functions sort of like these little flashcards that pop up. So here's an example from this lesson. Um, this is the word. You see uh, the image and the word, and then you flip it and you get the translation. This is the word for grandpa. And then there's two example sentences and these are usually lines from the video. Emma Fawcett. And you can hear uh, the recording. And I wanted to focus in this section on the images. So like I said, Rosetta Stone can provide stock images for these products, and they did provide a lot of stock images, but we tried to use um, custom created images where we could, and all the images were curated by members of the Chickasaw Rosetta Stone team. Here are two more examples of some more of the vocabulary images, some more of the custom images that were created. And these are two more family terms. We have daughter and son. And I wanted to point out here that um, the family being shown in the videos is also real family. Uh, the actresses playing uh, mother and daughter are actually mother and daughter, and the actors playing the father and son are actually father and son. Um, at the moment, the product does have a lot of stock images, but we do have plans once we finish level four this year to then go back and try to replace as many of the images we can with these custom ones because they're just so much richer um, and better for the learner. Once you finish the vocabulary section, you then move into this usage section. Um, this is really text heavy, but it also usually has audio for every sort of card. It works similarly to the, to the vocabulary flashcards, the cards pop up. Um, they show you something in the language and then they explain it as well. So here's an example of uh, a usage card from the same lesson. And this is discussing some variation in pronunciation and spelling. And when the card pops up, you hear the audio. So I'm going to play the audio, and then Josh is going to take over from here to discuss um, the audio. All right. So what you just heard was um, several speakers. The first um, Chikashi Yagani was me, and then native speakers, Stan Smith, you heard Luther John, and then Rose Shields Jefferson. Um, not only in, in the recordings themselves, but also in some of the background tech, the speech recognition technology, we felt like it was really critical for, um, for our community of learners to be able to hear both native speakers and then conversational affluent second language speakers. Um, so we, we mixed these um, in as much as we were able to. Um, and in capturing the, the um, sort of the source audio for the speech recognition component, we included a variety of people, many of whom had never spoken Chickasaw before, full on native speakers and then those of us that are somewhere in the middle. Um, because we wanted people to not feel like there was some sort of unreachable um, standard that they have to be as native-like as possible to be considered a speaker or to communicate, because that's just simply not the case. Right. So again, I'd like to reinforce that this is truly a custom solution. Rosetta Stone had never done anything like this, particularly to this degree and so focused so heavily on video. Um, the choices that we made were simply reflections of community values. Um, as Dr. Morgan mentioned, both Dr. Chu and I are citizens of, our, of the Chickasaw Nation, and it was really critical to us to provide something 
where a citizen could be using it and see something reflected uh, of themselves. So all of these lessons center on uh, Chickasaw families. Um, all the extras um, are Chickasaw citizens. Um, we carefully curated the images. Many will are customized, and as Dr. Morgan said, eventually they'll all be um, Chickasaw images that we'll actually create ourselves. The focus on home, family, community, um, and how they bring their language out um, to places all across the reservation and even north of the reservation into Oklahoma City. Um, it's a it's a strange and sort of artificial world that we've created, but it's one that we aspire to. You know, we haven't had natural speech transmission in the home since the 1940s until quite recently. Um, but this is something that we we truly hope to see in the future is Chickasaw people using their language um, to communicate with one or one another again. All right. So today we have over 8,100 users of Rosetta Stone Chickasaw. When we first began this project, our goal was 10% of the tribal population. And you know that would be 7,300 people now. So we've clearly exceeded that goal. Um, this curriculum is significant. And that it's the very first multi-level comprehensive in-depth curriculum with regular assessments ever created for Chikashanumpa. Um, additionally, Dr. Chu has created an expansion curriculum to be used in classrooms. Um, and classrooms in the broadest sense of that term. Um, you can take this individual sort of asynchronous experience and, and it's being um, used in very interesting and particular ways to create interactive group experiences and to develop in, in some ways new speech communities, both in person and then online. So specifically at uh, Bing High School, which is north of us, there are 70 some odd students in two sections. Uh, that are learning Chickasaw using Dr. Chu's expansion curriculum with the base of Rosetta Stone Chickasaw. Um, and they're really, it's a really, really interesting group of kids. They're loving what they're doing. They're creating in a language. They're creating memes. Um, they're, they love it. It's, it's really very, it's wonderful, frankly. Uh, the, the curriculum itself, the program itself, is also being used for online community classes and study groups, um, and it plays a critical part in our new adult immersion program, the sort of underlying scope and sequence, um, and some of the stories that we're able to pull from the, the product. One of the most um, sort of personally meaningful aspects of this expansion to me is this, um, the sort of the reality of the online community classes or study groups. You know, these are totally citizen led. Um, it wasn't our idea necessarily. It just popped up and started doing it. Um, and what's what's really great when I visit these these groups is that they're actually using this product to to begin to communicate with one another. Um, even if it isn't a virtual space, it's a new kind of life for our language. And this is something that we're deeply committed to. Okay. All right. Uh, we appreciate uh, this time. Uh, we'd be happy to, uh, we'll take any questions at the end, or if you want to email us, contact information is here. Um, we regularly consult with people that uh, and communities that are interested in doing something with Rosetta Stone, or also considering something um, sort of off on their own that's Rosetta Stone-like. So we'd be happy to share the lessons that we've learned in any way that we can. Yaku ki chimene. Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you so much to Lakosh and Juliet for sharing about this project. Um, it's near and dear to my heart too, um, because as Lakosh mentioned, you know, bringing the language back into the home is so important. And actually for my family, Rosetta Stone Chickasaw um, has been really important because I not only worked on it, which actually was a really good learning experience in terms of increasing proficiency in the language, but now I can use it with my little one. And it's actually one of the most helpful tools um, that my family has to making Chickasaw language of the home and, and raising a little one in the language. Um, 
you know, and it's really special for her to have access to speakers who, you know, have, who have passed on and she can hear their voices and connect with them that way when she sees them in the videos and she hears their words, you know, coming through the computer screen. Carrie, my apologies, but I would like all the attendees to know that uh, Carrie's daughter, Hatuf Bushik, is the first native speaker since the 1940s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Her first, her first language that she heard was Chukashinumpa, and we've been doing our best to keep that up. But you know, with the pandemic, you know, I think that that's kind of at the a backdrop of all of this too is kind of separated time with family and speakers. And so Rosetta Stone Chickasaw has been a really amazing tool for us um, during this time. So let's check back in with Tanya with our graphic recording. Perfect, thank you. That was a beautiful presentation um, and, and just really inspiring to see how, how this work has come to life. Um, and specifically that piece around connecting uh, people to language from wherever they are, um, and that the Rosetta Stone work is customized for Chickasaw uh, using videos and flashcards and language and translations. And it's very important that community is represented in that as well and, and seeing families and people and faces. Um, so further connecting people uh, back to community and language. And the beautiful, inspiring piece around you can create content using whatever language learners you have available with a small team. You don't have to have fancy sets. And that most of all, it's really beautiful to hear voices of elders um, and language keepers who may not be with us anymore as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, okay. So the, the remainder of our time is open for questions and we have um, a lot of questions coming in through the Q and A, um, and what you know, one of the questions that I see coming up is around the the platforms that everyone chose to use, and so you've probably heard, you know, not just of Rosetta Stone and seven thousand languages, but also like Duolingo and Memrise. There's lots of them out there, um, and all of them have different types of features. There's pros and cons of all of them, and so. Um, one question that came up, and I'll start off with Heather and Olivia, if you could speak to this. Um, you know, what made you choose 7,000 languages for your course? Um, I, I would like to say that it was after a lot of uh, research and, and soul searching and things like that, that we chose 7,000 languages but it was actually the product of one day um, looking on the internet as I often do for opportunities. And I saw this one from the National Research Council of Canada saying that they had funding um, to uh, create online courses and it was with 7,000 languages. And so I reached out and that was, that was the start really. Um, our organization is um, small and um, we don't have core funding. It's project-based funding, really is what has been keeping us afloat and, and my family, I guess. <laughs> but um, so we had to look for, for a way. And um, since it was going to be the platform, it was going to be free and 7,000 7, languages was donating their time and, and the development. And um, the National Research Council of Canada was going to pay for um, the costs of developing on our side um, it was really that was that was what why we chose it and if this opportunity hadn't come up, uh, come across our path um, we probably wouldn't have an online course today yeah, okay and I know in the chat and the webinar that there's others that are creating courses on 7,000 languages and also that Stephanie um, who is the executive director of 7,000 languages is here um, and shared information in the chat. So you can always reach out to 7,000 languages directly if you have questions about that platform. Um, and Lakosh and Juliet, you talked a little bit about, you know, coming to a Rosetta Stone Chickasaw project, but I wondered if you might speak to why specifically Rosetta Stone, were there certain features of it that were appealing compared to other platforms? I think ultimately the, the 
the reality of the situation was is that we needed to partner with um, with a group that had the 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 ability to pull off this thing which was so massive in scope. And so we made the sort of decision to work with Rosetta Stone because they had, um, frankly, a compelling platform. Like everyone has been saying, it's just a tool. But we felt like not only was there interest from citizens because, you know, everyone's like, oh, Rosetta Stone, I know that. that they're like, they must be the greatest language company in the world. In part, it's, it was motivational because they think, oh, that's really cool based on Rosetta Stone's really excellent marketing. Um, but there were other there were other options, like you mentioned Duolingo, and that simply was not going to work for us because it's largely crowdsourced. There is one fluent speaker who can read and write in modern orthography, and that's me. The native speakers do not care to do any of that work. So, I mean, how you know, there was it was just like a non-starter. Um, obviously we had some concerns about intellectual property and we were able to work through those. But um, th for the same reason, we partnered with um, a, a media group that would create the videos because, you know, they're good at creating videos. We're good at language. Rosetta Stone's good at presenting this language in an interesting way online. So um, at a certain point, even though we offered kind of a DIY approach, governor uh expressed his commitment to this project and he said i don't care there's no price to be put on language um so it was entirely funded by tribal government okay so that actually connects really nicely to another question that has come in um and candace maybe i'll ask you this question um to start us off is what ideas do you have for funding language projects that incorporate technology? I think some of this was uh, touched upon in the various presentations today. I think about, you know, what is our immediate language goals and what are the best ways to reach these language goals? Is it through technology or are there other more meaningful, appropriate and relevant practices that we can um, look to um, and not force ourselves into technology. Uh, I think, you know, knowing what resources are available, so getting an environmental scan of human resources that are available, you know, language speakers, language teachers, language learners, what financial support is there, and digital infrastructure that is in existence. Oftentimes we don't realize what kind of infrastructure we need in order to um, create these digital tools and technologies and to access the outcome or the output of them. Can we leverage our resources and networks that we have access to in our communities, in the places that we work, the universities? And then thinking of in locating funds, um, learning more about the funding agency, their motivation, their intention, uh, their mission. Is this a one-off funding or do they offer sustainable funding? I think Heather talked about this in, in um, their work. Also, is funding limited to documentation and preservation or does it support language revitalization, reclamation and education efforts? I often see um, funding that is available, but again, it doesn't support that living language aspect. Like our languages are living and are breathing and we need to be using this in community. Um, I'd also begin to find out what are the parameters of the grant or the funding? What is required at the end of the grant or throughout the grant? Do we need to deposit our language into a repository? And then going back to, again, what was discussed in, in all of our presentations, who will essentially own control and have access to these materials? Um, so an early investigation of, again, legal issues around intellectual property, copyright, and data sovereignty. After all of this background information is done, then determining what are we willing to give up or negotiate or produce in order to get funding. In the end, we're all competing for the same funding and the same funding is very limited. So what ways can we work together to inform our languages um, in our specific communities? So like Lakash said, we can form partnerships. So looking to even other communities or indigenous organizations and learn from their practices. 
Um, so these are just some of my thoughts in regards to funding, not directly ask, uh, answering where to look for funding, but again, all the considerations when um, looking at, at funding resources. Yeah, okay, Candice. So shifting gears now, um, these courses can be really helpful. You know, I think we've seen a lot of benefits for beginning language learners of increasing proficiency fairly quickly, um, you know, using an online course. And so Lakosh and Juliet, I wondered what potential do you see for online courses to support, you know, maybe more advanced language learners or even, you know, fluent speakers? That's a really interesting question. I'm not really sure that the answer to it is fully developed, um, you know, here in the, the, the small group of people that's doing this work. But we do see, I have, I've seen people moving increasingly to sort of intermediate kind of levels of proficiency. And they're just chomping at the bit to get level four because they know that something really cool is coming. Um, I guess the most immediate application of that for uh, language learners would be um, a significant aspect of uh, Chickas Rosetta Stone, Chickasaw Level 3 and 4, um, developed really from Dr. Chu's input, uh, was a focus on narratives. This is something that if I could go back in time, we would redo levels 1 and 2. Um, but these narratives are, are so integral to who we are as a people, and they're such a powerful tool. We're pulling them out, as I mentioned earlier, and using them in the adult immersion program. Um, so while those, those adult participants are learning, you know, they'll, they'll work through all 140 lessons of Chickasaw, Rosetta Stone Chickasaw. Um, more importantly, they're using um, the the stories, narratives from our native speakers to become truly proficient in, in a relatively short period of time. As far as the benefits for native speakers, it, at least um, in my experience, there's a real, there's just a joy to be had as they spend time together. In so many ways, they're socially isolated other than outside of their families because there's no one to talk to anymore. So as we bring them together, they're able to laugh and joke and talk and watch these videos that they helped author and see other learners and native speakers using their language. You know, it's like 1953 all over again and they're hanging out under that tree on Main Street here in Ada. It's really, it's pretty awesome. And they're real, they're like real overt about it. Like we love this. We love getting together. We're so tired of COVID. We just want to talk Chickasaw. So um, it's been really good to, as our case counts drop here on the reservation. Um, as of yesterday, we have one person with COVID in our hospital, which is a big deal. Uh, we're looking forward to some something new in the summer, uh, and they are too. Okay. And you know, I'll add to, you all saw one of these videos and I know that in the chat, people were really enjoying it. Um, and so thinking about, you know, a point that Heather and Olivia also made that, you know, some of the components of these courses can be repurposed in different ways. Well, those videos are actually like media content that's all in the language. And so while my two-year-old maybe doesn't sit down and log into Rosetta Stone Chickasaw to use the whole interface, she definitely logs on and looks at the videos. And that's, you know, one of the only forms of media right now that she has in Chickasaw to engage in. So. Um, there's kind of a cult following around the characters, especially the, the son, the Shoba. Um, he's always playing pranks on people. And so um, the kids in the high school class love him. My two-year-old loves him. Every time he does something funny, they're always like, the Shoba, <laughs> at it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So our next question is about, um, you know, typically we think of these courses as serving those middle generations, our adults and our older youth who didn't grow up with the language. And so Heather and Olivia, I wondered, you know, what are your thoughts about how we can use these technologies like online courses 
to actually engage young children and elders, you know, even more. Olivia, do you have some thoughts you want to share first or? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't know that I, you know, have any concrete answers. Like our, we designed our course sort of aimed at beginning learners that are, you know, middle school and up, I think. Um, I really like the idea of using videos, like you guys have been saying. I think that is really engaging. Um, Wanda, Heather, do you have thoughts? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I do know that um, one of the um, people that is a user of our course and who we featured in our slides, um, Candice B, her daughter, is eight years old and loves using the course. So I thought, you know, I went, I thought about that and said, wow, you know, um, we thought it was like Olivia was saying for more middle school enough because it's text-based, but she obviously is able to deal with the, the you know, the text and, and a lot of it is quite simple. So in the beginning anyways. So yeah, so I, I don't know, there's that. And then, and then I do know, of, it depends on who you mean by older. I mean, I'm already 60 years old, but I know of other either latent speakers or older people that um, people older than me that never got a chance to learn the language and they're comfortable online with, with the course, they're using it. It's not, it's not that hard an interface. So um, I don't know, I think more and more people are getting comfortable with, with online with call type, um, uh, you know, um, pedagogy and, uh, but in a perfect world in ours, we would have used a lot more um, images. And I think I, this was on, mentioned in one of the slides, We've and we would have used video, we absolutely would have. And you can, with 7,000 languages, do that. But there were some certain constraints, um, not the least of which, which was, uh, you know, um, was money and also time. So you have to do what you can do within, you know, within the time and the resources that you have. But, um, but yeah, I mean, video is, Video is awesome, um, and uh, yeah. So I'm, you know, I look at uh, the Rosetta Stone course and think, yeah, that would be wonderful too, you know. But we're pleased with um, with the response that we've had to to our small contribution as well. And the games, the game, like and, and the quotes that we had from the users, they were it was the games I think that really stuck out to the the kid, the users' kids. So yeah. Gamification, I guess, is um, fun. You have to have fun. It has to be play. If they can, you know, if people can play. I mean, that's the other thing with um, with our language. And, you know, I can't speak for, um, for Chickasaw, but the number of domains in which we can use our language is are really limited. And so being able to have fun together and have an emotional attachment to language through using, say, a course like this, you know, that's really the best we can ask for. Yeah, okay. So I know that we don't have time to get to every question that's been asked, but one really great question that came up is, are there trainings that I could do to learn more about um, language revitalization, creating curriculum for Indigenous languages? And Candace, I know that you've been involved with the American Indian Language Development Institute and other programs, so I wondered if you might um, want to give a little plug for those types of programs. Yeah. Um, I think the American Indian Language Development Institute that, that you just mentioned is um, a great resource and a great place uh, that brings together Indigenous language speakers, learners, and allies. Um, and so they do training, and I believe this summer is done online. Uh, there are other Indigenous language institutes that some of us are familiar with, um, the Northwest Indian Language Institute, um, SILDI, the Canadian Indigenous Language and Literacy Development Institute. There are also other, uh, maybe more regional institutes um, and programs uh, like Breath of Life. Um, and then of course, some of the universities that we are affiliated with. So the University of British Columbia, um, University of Victoria, where Carrie um, visited as a professor there for a couple of years, and then University of Oklahoma as well. So I think there are 
Now, a growing number of programs or courses or institutes, indigenous institutes, oh, I should also mention the Indigenous Language Institute in Santa Fe, um, that offer training for individuals and communities wanting to revitalize language through technology. And again, because uh, we are still you know, grappling with the pandemic, these opportunities are now afforded um, online. And so take a look at what is out there. And, and I know within this community that you often see um, even workshops offered by some of the, the panelists here. So um, just a shout out and um, mahalo to all of you who've uh, presented today. I've learned so much and am, am inspired by all of your work, mahalo. Okay. So, and if anyone in the chat knows other programs, feel free to um, drop a link to those. I wanna say thank you all for coming. Um, we have a final slide that shares words of thanks in the languages of our presenters and organizing team. As you sign off, we invite you to share in the chat a short message of encouragement to others who are working to learn, teach, and speak their indigenous languages. Happy International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Yakuke ichimeni ichipisa chong.